Good afternoon. Um, first of all, I want to thank Parallel Police Institute for, of Cryptography, Anarchy. <laughs> I love them, but I don't belong here. I am uh, too old. Uh, to learn new things as much as I love them. I love to be curious, but some things are beyond my comprehension, like Bitcoin, for instance. I never had a crown spur to invest, so I, I'm not going to talk about that as well. My qualification to speak here is stuffled. I am a dissident. And uh, I learned through years that uh, once you embrace that kind of career, it's forever. Uh, no government will ever be pleased with me. And I am proud of being uh, swerved and uh, disliked by all the prime ministers since the fall of communism. It's a great pride. Uh, <clears throat> second, I apologize for not being tidy. I made a promise to my wife. We will celebrate joint uh, anniversary. She'll be 60 and I'll be 70 next March. And she wants to see me with a beard and a ponytail. So I started to grow a beard and a ponytail. Um, I'll be rewarded for that. Mm, I will be allowed to jump with a parachute again. So, uh, being 70 means that you remember a lot. I had a grateful life so far. And I remember a horse carried postal wagons in streets of Prague. We loved it as kids. I remember steam locomotives. I remember the first uh, men on orbit, Yuri Gagarin. I remember first men on the moon. I remember the Vietnam War assassination of, of uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, his brother, Martin Luther King. I remember wars, jails. <laughs> uh, and all this in not even 70 years. That's how times are running fast these days. And what we believe is history is with us. And I am a living testimony to that. I brought something heavy. Anybody who would recognize it? This is one of the first, yes? <laughs> no, no, not really. Uh, this is one of the first laptop computers brought into Czechoslovakia in June 1989. It was a generous gift from uh, one American university to us Czechoslovak dissidents. And uh, I have done some damage to the regime, I hope. It's proverbial Toshiba T1600. Uh, pass it around, please, so that you see <laughs> what it meant a laptop computer. Uh, uh, the Communist secret police didn't like it, and the, they were so unqualified that they confiscated it uh, the night that I brought it home from the customs uh, before I was even able to, uh, to upload the Czech alphabet into it. So I couldn't have committed any thought crime yet. So eventually they had to uh, give it back. I keep it with me as a reminder of the times 
constantly are changing. And um, I would love to find somebody uh, who could bring it back to life because it's dead already. It's heavy. And I, I love to remember that I was able to run with it in the sandals away from secret police. But that's uh, not what I want to talk about today. This is just an illustration. It's only 10 generations between Industrial Revolution and now. My question is, have we learned the lesson from the most dramatic change in human history? Because Industrial Revolution changed everything. But most importantly, it has changed our identity, human identity, because we were made uh, to live in, in local communities, in regional communities, and our identity was to be from somewhere and to be for something. Thanks to Industrial Revolution, uh, out of a sudden, specifically talking about Europe, uh, we are uh, out of a sudden made citizen of a nation state. And that's a uh, horrifying structure because you are identified by your language. You are obliged to be one nation defined by that language. And you have the government ac acquiring more and more control over every individual and every identity, every region. From that time on, our identity is to be against somebody, against anybody who is not with us. That's a historical breakthrough. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> ten generations, as I said, mere ten generations. And only now, I hope, we can see, thanks to technical innovations, a possibility to cut through the borders, the same way we've been able to cut barbed wire on the borders of communist bloc and to create, maybe not regions, but uh, collectives or, or social groups of like-minded people, Viet, Viet, no, no, I love it. <laughs> uh, uh, be it uh, uh, around cryptonarchy or Bitcoin, I don't care. People who do not need their governments to tell them who they are. That was always my dream. Um, I'm so old-fashioned that I have to read it. Yeah. But the genius is of industrial revolution, mechanics and engineers had great dreams about how uh, technical innovation uh, will change uh, human life, will, uh, will bring more education to more people, will bring more people into the cities and uh, with it better health care, um, Life was supposed to be great. And to a certain extent, uh, extent it definitely happened. Uh, longer life, expectancy, better health care sooner or later. Uh, we, were even uh, we, were, we were even able to abolish child labor. Uh, on a way, we gave women voting rights around 1900. Uh, uh, some countries uh, invented uh, social care, health system. 
on the way we also uh, found sports and entertainment. Great cultural change. Who would have thought that pop idols will be dictating the norms of behavior, fashion, and political thinking? Films, film stars, and so on, so on, so on. But the core question is, what has gone wrong? Because in short uh, retrospect, uh, what followed the formation of nation states was more conflict, more wars, anti-Semitism, uh, two world wars, with concentration camps and gas chambers, totalitarian regimes, uh, ruling over more than a billion people. The states, the governments, have acquired more and more control over individual people's lives. The exact opposite of what the dreamers of industrial revolution dreamt about. And it seems as if we are at the same crossroad these days because so-called information revolution, digital revolution, is bringing with it equally great dreams. Are we up to fulfilling them or will we allow the governments nation-state governments to dictate who is able to control and how much control we are willing to, to give our governments over our lives, our economies, our well-being. Uh, so to me, as a historian, the question is, are we able to learn from the mistakes of the past? My answer to that is, I don't know. I'm looking around for hopeful signs like your gatherings and ideas, and I'm worried about uh, uh, the willingness uh, with which the societies are, are freely giving out their freedoms, uh, allowing the facial recognition uh, being used in the cities, and so on, so on, so on. Uh, the 20th century brought only two, uh, three new elements into the fore. Uh, we have tested a uh, totalitarian experience of militarized, totally to centralized state control over the society. Later on, uh, we have embraced consumption society and uh, still later, information explosion. But uh, with this came uh, recognition of uh, what is nation-state, because nation-state is the, uh, the birthbed of modern nationalism. I talked about that identity for something, being from somewhere and you are for something, but now uh, we are destined or taught by our governments uh, until recently, to be against somebody. The Czechs uh, have a eternal problem. We still don't know who the hell we are. If we cross out our enemies or specters behind the borders, we don't have positive mission. Who the hell are we? I'm Czech because I'm not German, American, Russian. Very strange. Um, 
For a book I am preparing, I, I made dozens of interviews and I asked uh, 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 the people, mm, who are we? Why, why is it good to be Czech? And the most frequent, uh, frequent answer I got, well, because we are not Germans. <laughs> hey, I'm a pigeon because I'm not a fox. Something strange here. Uh, so, this changed identity, very complex and, and complete, uh, is with us and uh, we tend to believe that it, it is unsolvable, that it is with us uh, since eternity, not true. This is today's form of na forms of nationalism are 19th century invention. And uh, they are uh, products of uh, so-called politics of uh, cultural it will come, <laughs> I promise, uh, cultural despair. Uh, a wonderful book about 19th century Germany, uh, Germanic thought uh, by Fritz Stern, uh, my colleague from New York University. Uh, one of the best books uh, explaining the, the modern history of Europe. Uh, you lose your culture, you lose your identity, you lose who you are, and you embrace state-imposed nation thought, nationalism instead. What follow, we have mentioned, if two world wars is not enough or are not enough to learn the lesson, then what is? And st still you have idiots in all our societies who want to exclude people of color, people of different thought, people this, that. Uh, the Czech form of idiots uh, screams Ch Czech land studio, Czechs. Uh, genetic research proves that 95% of Czechs are not Czechs. But who cares? The biggest national, Czech nationalist on our political scene is half Japanese. And so on, so on, so on. Uh, the crossroad I mentioned is the misuse of information technologies. Uh, to me, the most dangerous dream for future are the techniques uh, tested, used, misused, and connected to the names of Cambridge Analytica. Uh, Beautiful dreams about parliamentary representative democracy uh, are connected uh, with the notion of democracy being the right of informed voters, rational, making rational decisions about their representation. What we see in the last 50 years in, with more and more clarity is that uh, we are the viewers or what is decisive force in today's quasi-democratic politics are, are uninformed television viewers or social media users uh, concentrating on, on emotions solely. I don't call it democracy anymore, but I don't have anything to replace it with. 
So I'm just screaming, beware. Atomization of our more and more polarized society mentioned by the speaker before me. Ironically, it is all held by new technologies, starting with television, then new media, and uh, programming of voter response. I, I, I just love the stupidity and immorality of this term. I read, uh, read some, some books and articles about Cambridge Analytica, and the guys using it or, or creating it freely confessed to look for being able to, to format voter behavior. To me, that's frightening. Uh, for me, as I think I made it clear, uh, the concept very strong in Europe and, and combined around the globe of a nation state is, uh, is the biggest danger. First of all, because nation states have totally destroyed and wiped out uh, what was through enlightenment and early industrial revolution the most important social group that I call the communicators. The people of different professions uh, 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 for whom the language was not the divisive element but was a tool of communication merely that. People who spoke freely uh, several languages as it was so frequent in, in specifically Central Europe with uh, multi-ethnic history uh, that ended only in 1945. Uh, my grandfather was one of them. He was totally bilingual Czech and German. For him there was no difference. It was just two languages that he used. Uh, as, as kids, we always used to run to him in the morning and, and uh, asking, you know, in what language did you dream tonight? And I'm sure he lied and he was inventing stories, but, <laughs> but it, it, it was part of a great game. Uh, once we made the language uh, the obligation and the only decisive mark for our national identity, where was the rest of the quality? Where was morality? Where was um, political opinion? Where was cultural background? Where was regional roots? And uh, it was just the beginning of wars, expulsions. You may know that three million Germans were uh, forcefully expelled from this country who lived here for 800 years. And uh, some of us who, who dare to write about it in these days are still getting death threats. A friend of mine who wrote a, a book about it uh, had a bomb explode in front of his house, and that's 2020. So, information revolution, information breakthrough and change is a time of new dreams. And my dream would be that hey, out of a sudden we have a chance to break through the barriers. M maybe it's not about settling the like-minded people in, uh, in, in one region to get back to this, I belong somewhere. Uh, because of new techniques, new technologies, 
we can contact and com communicate with like-minded, open people uh, around the world, literally. And uh, to me, when I watch the nation states hating this, that's a proof of quality. So continue contacting, continue conspiring, continue to break uh, through the barriers. To me, as a former anti-communist dissident, it's, it's quite moving that the Prague the parallel police uh, has chosen the slogan and ideas of my friend Václav Benda, who back in the 70s has proposed this idea that, okay, I don't like the regime, so why don't we create parallel police, parallel society? We never made it, frankly. Uh, we were mm, hunted animals. Uh, so, take and use that wonderful term as you wish, but look for other examples. And I would suggest at the end of my talk, I promise, uh, that uh, I was uh, working in different war conflicts after 89 and also in Kosovo. Look at Ibrahim Rugoa, the literature professor who was able to create truly working parallel society to, to Serbian military domination. They were able to create independent schooling, independent health care, and for several years they were able to keep a non-violent uh, resistance. Uh, admirable. Uh, it's only when uh, we in the West have betrayed their cause and sold them out in, in Dayton Peace Accord. Uh, so uh, Rugova lost because uh, younger and more aggressive uh, elements uh, have opted for armed struggle. Nevertheless, this is the example to follow. My wish for your activities would be look into the possibility of creating international university. Maybe it can be online, but education is the key. Create your followers. And uh, in my opinion, that would be the way to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for this inspirational uh, talk. Uh, I would like to assure you, you definitely belong to Parallel Polis and you are always welcome with your wife. You will get coffee for free for life. <laughs> uh, do we have uh, any question from uh, audience? Thank you very much uh, for your talk. I really enjoyed that. Uh, and you, you spoke a lot about identity and was a bird hanging around a lot. And uh, my question is, how would you define the identity in a relationship to, uh, to an individual and also in a relationship uh, to a community? Meaning, what is, according to you, an uh, identity of the individual and uh, identity of a community? How would you define that? That's the question of my life. <laughs> I have no uh, one answer. On individual level, identity means that uh, you can talk to yourself and to people near to you. Karl Jaspers wrote about it many decades ago. And if not being proud, 
at least to feel that you haven't lost people around you because of your mistakes. Above that, if you are able to, uh, to get a feeling of belonging to community, which uh, for me is extremely difficult. But uh, I would think that this is the way. It's not that you agree all the time, but uh, it's about respecting disagreement and still being together. I, I was 26 when I was kicked out from my job because of being disloyal to the regime. And at that time I lived in a, in a city of 11,000 inhabitants. Everybody knew everybody else. And people whom I took for friends until then were crossing to the other side of the street, so they wouldn't be seen talking to me or meeting with me. And uh, in a way, for, for most of my life, this has stayed to me uh, in, a, in a manner that I do not want to belong to somebody. I want that respect, I want to give respect. And I definitely don't want to be judged and valued by my language. I, I teach in, in one of the best universities in the world, as I believe. I don't have even Czech doctorate. And, and Czech universities, universities regard me as controversial. Uh, so, uh, maybe it's just, I don't like Czechs, <laughs> I don't know. I love being Czech, but, you know, I hate lying about own history. I don't know if I answered anything. Okay, yeah, we have another question. Uh, thank you for your talk. I would like to ask a question if you, if you believe or think that the future, uh, the future of society without a state is a possibility. Not, and maybe you can give us how much of a possibility it is, maybe in percentage or something. Thank you. I don't think we'll get rid of the states. Uh, I, my hope would be that uh, we will be able to create collectives large enough to, uh, to live uh, outside of state super control, uh, bringing uh, its own code of morality, its own uh, trustworthiness and truth. Uh, what I really dislike in this 200 years uh, uh, since uh, the formation of nation states is that we have to believe in state given history. In my country's respect, 90% of it is blatant fucking lie. We adore presidents who were war criminals. I have found documents proving that President Benesh, our post-war hero, he betrayed the country on, on numerous occasions and uh, opened the gate for the communist coup d'etat. He was uh, in 45. Not only that he prevented his opponents from coming back from exile, but he even personally ordered jailing of their wives and kids. And I'm supposed to believe he was a Democrat? 
No way. So, you know, widening the space for independence is my dream. But for reasons of uh, uh, tradition, taxation, military security, I am afraid we will have to uh, deal with the state structures uh, still for some time. Do we have more questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I have two hands, so I could have two microphones in actual fact, but I only have one mouth, which is probably a good idea. Um, there are three parts to this. One is a simple one. Uh, do you have a floppy disk for your computer? I do. Good. Uh, that's worth a lot of money as well. Uh, and how many people in this audience have actually seen a floppy disk, which is a very interesting one. The serious question, uh, the Cambridge Analytica, um, very scary, it is, uh, as you say. I think it also is just one demonstration of many actions that are going on around the world, um, but they're actually actions which are um, perpetrated by individuals who know the power of IT, and they want to influence, but they're not states as such. The individuals with their own agendas. So that, in fact, is something which goes against what is, is in, in your favour, which is saying that states should not control us all. That's the second part of it, sorry. And the last part is something that's right, right in front of us, which is the use of the mask and the belief of COVID and the instructions from state to wear mask, et cetera, et cetera, and your opinions upon that as well, mm -hmm. if I may. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, as a historian, uh, you don't have many safe bets, but one is sure and safe. There is no example uh, which would show the state not being the first to misuse new technologies since Industrial Revolution. And the same goes for, uh, for acquiring more and more control. The states are always advanced party to the use of new technology, with all dangers attached. And uh, about COVID, you know, I'm, mm, my friend uh, has it and is in quite serious state. Uh, and it's not only because of him that I uh, take it seriously. But at the same time, this is not new. We've had pandemics before. We are much better equipped. From moral standpoint, unfortunately, we don't have other structures than the state to tell us uh, what to do. And as usually, the states, the governments are overdoing it, in my opinion. You know, 200 years ago to be the church. Uh, now we have our governments with all their experts and ministries and science and statistics and whatever, modeling, uh, computer modeling and whatever. Let them do their work. But the minute I have, I'll have a sense that they are stepping on my freedom, and it's not about you know covering my mouth or whatever, but. Uh, limiting information exchange or, or, or hiding information, I'll scream because that's my basic freedom. Uh, I'm not if I'm satisfied. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, thank, thank you very much. I mean, anything you say is very interesting. Uh, um, I happen to come from the UK, although I live in Prague, for, and this is my home for seven years. Um, uh, and um, so I have a, uh, a slightly different uh, view on certain things, uh, uh, which is complementary in many ways. So I thank you, uh, and there's nothing else I need to say at this moment in time. I'll hand it to somebody else, thank so you. thank you very much.